Hello, people. Uh, I assume you guys can hear me. Usually, people can't hear me. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, I have a sort of reputation in my company for being the guy you can hear on the second floor when you're on the first. Um, so I apologize if I'm too bad. Uh, so this um, this talk is about cracking Perl's old hash function. Um, uh, some of you may have followed um, some of the controversy on Perl five quarters and in related places, um, where there's been all kinds of I don't know malinformation or misinformation or crazy arguments and and just people not really I don't know knowing what they're talking about when they decide to talk about it. Um, now some of that has been because. Basically, we didn't tell people what the real problem was because it was a security issue and we felt that that would be irresponsible. So, um, this will be actually the first time some of the material that I'm about to speak has been publicly presented in any kind of forum. Uh, Pro 5 port, the, the Pro 5 security list is the only place where at least part of this has been publicly, uh, well, in any way discussed. Um, so in 2013, we discovered various issues with Perl's hash implementation. Um, this was not actually a novel discovery. Um, in like 2000, we actually found out about some of these issues um, right around the time that 5.8.0 was released. Um, the primary issue relates to something that's called an algorithmic complexity attack on, ha on, on the hash function, which is basically an attempt to cause the hash function to um, uh, basically go into a, um, I just lost the word, um, a pathological uh, case for a hash is where all the items hash into the same bucket. That then makes what should be an O1 operation into an ON operation, scanning that list of, of, um, of items. Um, and um, it turns out that the work that we did in 2000, in, um, in 2000 was uh, really not quite up to the requirements of the problem. Um, and hey, Max. Um, and in, um, in 2013, there were a lot of um, there was an announcement about vulnerabilities that were found in Python, Ruby, so on and so forth, coming from Jeff Daniel Bernstein, who broke Murmur Hash. Um, and actually was able to, to find uh, what's called a multi-collision attack on Murmur Hash. Now, that, I found out about that one week after I switched Perl to use Murmur Hash to be a faster hash function, <laughs> so we then switched it back. Um, we actually switched it to SIP Hash, which is the secure hash that Daniel Bernstein uh, suggests. Fortunately, it wasn't slow enough, so then we switched back to both one at a time hard, um, which is a variant on our old hash function that, that basically avoids some of the security problems that we know of, but there's some concern that it's slow. Now I'll just say, I'm, I'm not going to cover too much of this past this point in the talk, but at Booking we've actually rolled out pearls using variety of diff uh, at, using a, a fast hash function, murmur hash. We've tested it on production loads and it makes no difference whatsoever. The amount of time it takes to hash keys um, gets instantly swamped by everything else that happens. So all these people bleeding on about how like how horrible it is that one at a time processes like like byte by byte and is like a million times slower than murmur hash, right? Well there's nothing in Perl that does hashes inside of a hot loop at a million like a go. So it doesn't matter. Um, by the time the context switches and L1 cache flushes and all that kind of CPU stuff happens, all of the performance benefit of using something like murmur hash goes out the window. At least that's what we've seen. Um, so whether or not we actually switch in the future is another question, but that's not what this talk is about. So the first problem that, that we found was CVE 2013-1667, of which I'm inordinately proud as it's my first CVE. Um, and what it turned out was that in 5.8, when we, in, we found out about this algorithmic complexity attack, we added some de defensive measures to Perl to prevent these attacks from producing pathological behavior. Um, the problem was is that you could attack that mechanism itself. And by feeding 512 carefully selected keys, you would cause Perl to chew up all the memory on your box. Um, 
Now, when we found this, it turned out that the fix was relatively simple. It was just to disable the defensive mechanism in the first place. Um, uh, and um, most vendors nowadays seem to be on patched versions. Um, uh, are you vulnerable? This is being published widely. This is on, on a blog post that I wrote for booking.com on, on our blog site. So if you look for a blog page called hardening Pearl's hash function, you'll find this one-liner. If you run that one-liner, it should show you something like one of the two lines below. This basically, if, if, if that prints out not okay, then you're vulnerable to the attack, the attack that I'm about to show you. So what does the attack look like? That's it. All I have to do is feed these keys into a hash on an old Perl, and it will chew up more memory than you can put onto a computer. Okay? That simple. So, that meant that what we were doing was not sustainable, and we had to change. Um, so, how do we... What, what other problems were there? There was a problem that was found by Ruslan Zakharov, um, which was a key discovery attack on, on Perl's hash function. Um, the, um, the basic idea of the attack is fairly simple. If you have a web server or something like that that is returning data back to the user in the native key order of the hash, um, uh, and if, I can, if, if you are returning data that I've supplied to you in that hash, then I can observe the order that these items have, have been returned. I can then start feeding you different, different sets of keys and building up metadata about the ordering results that they get back. Eventually, and rather quickly, you get enough data to actually be able to brute force the seed and find all the seeds that would produce those orders, which then allows you to generate more keys to feed back into the equation to refine your, your attack until eventually you know what the key is. Um, so I have a program I'm going to show you in a little bit um, that is capable of doing that in between four and five fetches to the web server. Um, so it's comprehensively broken. Um, the attack basically relies on a number of vulnerabilities, um, uh, which I'm listing, listing here. The main thing is, is that when hashing a single byte value, the seed is improperly mixed. And the high bits of the of the seed are basically um, the high bits of the hash value are basically the seed passed through, um, and this then allows you to actually search two to the twenty bits instead of two to the thirty two bits, which is the difference between doing it in an eye blink and doing it in the amount of time it takes you to scratch your head, right? Um, the second problem is just that simple. It only uses thirty two bits of state. You can iterate from 0 to 2 to 32 on a modern laptop or a modern CPU in a few seconds. So you can then try every seed to see what it produces right, relatively easily. Um, so that fact alone by itself basically means that any 32-bit hash function is completely not up to scratch. Um, and then to make things even worse, Perl's old hash function actually um, use the zero as the seed um, for all Perl versions. So what that means is that I can sit on my computer, brute force an attack set of keys to feed to your computer, and I know what your computer will do. That is why the hash function in Perl 5.18 and later is randomized, and why it is randomized at multiple levels. Um, so how do you evaluate that a hash function is good? Um, normally, you apply these two criteria. Um, I'm not saying that that's an exhaustive list, but these two are, are the main that you'll see in the literature <coughs> when discussing these things. The first is the strict, strict avalanche criteria. So what that says is that in modifying one bit of the input stream, or actually one bit of the seed, should, should result in 50% of the bits in the output hash being changed. Okay? So if I change one bit in the, in, the, in the key I'm hashing or one bit in the seed, either way, roughly 50% of the, of the time, um, half the bits should, sorry, half the bits should change um, every time. Uh, you can say that a couple of ways and I'm getting confused. Um, 
Um, so the second one is the bitwise independence criteria. Um, and what this says is that when any single one bit is inverted, the output bits, uh, there, there should be no output bits that always change, right? So, um, and there should be no pairs that change in predictable ways, right? So if I change bit zero, I should never get five and six always being zero or always being one or, or always flipping or whatever. It should, 50% of the time they should change, 50% of the time they shouldn't. Anything other than that basically means there's a vulnerability that you can attack. So, um, you can visualize this in, in um, basically this, this GIF. Those of you with good eyes and, and, and the ability to count, unlike me, will notice that I screwed this up and there's actually a, a column missing on the right hand side. But um, what this actually represents is, um, if you think about this on the horizontal axis, um, these are the bits of the seed and the input. Okay, and if you look at it vertically, these are the output bits of the hash. Okay, so what this says is that any of the bits up here, and this is bit zero of the seed, right? So what this says is that if I change the, the bit 32 of the seed, um, it does not affect the output at all, right? That's why it's red. Blue means good, red means bad, right? So you can see that there's these sort of stripes in here where there's some, some values that don't get, um, that, that don't flip quite at the right probability, but they're not bad. But up in that top right hand corner, we have a big block of, of bits which doesn't do the right thing at all. And in fact, this, is, this corner, this triangle here, is basically what Ruslan's um, attack um, exploits. Now what happens if we use two, two bytes worth of input data. It gets a little better. The triangle's smaller. Um, I don't know if you guys can see it as well as I can on the screen, but there's some diagonal lines underneath the, the red triangle, right? Um, and you can see that the, the, um, the first byte is completely mixed, right? The first byte of our input is completely mixed, but our last byte is not perfectly mixed, right? Um, so, with two bytes, if you change the, a bit in the first byte, you're good, basically. Uh, ignoring that, that top right hand corner, right? So now what happens if we go to three? Three bytes, we now see this mixing effect um, reducing again. The, the bits that are of the seed that are not um, involved are reduced. Um, and we can now see that the first two bytes of our key um, are being properly mixed. So now we up one more. And we can see that now we actually have good hashing, right? Um, all of the output bits are, are changing at 50% of the time. So there's a little bit of a problem in that the last byte of the key is still not affecting the output as much as it should. This should be completely blue and there's a little bit of red in there. Now that's intrinsic to this hash function. We're not really gonna make it go away. Um, now, this is, um, the bitwise independence criteria, it's a little bit harder to read, um, but basically the same kind of idea with this is the output, this is the input, and then basically I've just stacked all the i, j, and k's on top of each other in lines, right? And what we can see is that um, there's a set of bits that are being, that are, uh, are, in, are changing independently. Kind of interestingly, they're not the ones that are passing the SAC test, but I haven't quite gotten to the bottom of what that's about. I think that might just be an artifact of how I'm graphing it. Um, and you can see that it's sort of half red, half blue. Now, um, this is using probabilities. Um, and, and basically, the, the bluer it is, the closer we are to uh, um, a 50 uh, uh, passing a p-test. The redder we are, the, the closer we are to failing a p-test. Um, and what we expect to see, um, and, and this is where this like probabilities are kind of screwy, especially if you're not a good mathematician. Like, I'm not a good mathematician, so when you're like me, this stuff gets really screwy to think about. But you don't want to see all blue. Right? All blue is actually bad. Right? It means that there's no, it's not changing randomly, it's changing every time. And they are, they are independent, but they're, they're, they're always changing, right? 
So what you actually want to see is you want to see a really smooth, even set of blue and red that basically get, that represents randomness, right? If you um, if you do various random tests, like you should have a certain number of values that are outside and a certain number that are inside, and confidence values, and somebody mathematical will explain it to you if you really want to know. I'm just going to confuse you more, so I'm not going to bother. Um, so now what we can see is if we add another byte, it gets a little better. Our blue section gets smaller. Um, we're, not, we're seeing a better mix of red and blue. Three bytes, we've now got an even smaller part that's, that's um, you know. And then finally at four bytes, we basically have a nice even random mix of blue and red on everything except for our last, last byte of the key. So now, if you sort this, um, it, I find the sorted representation easier to kind of see. Um, the other thing is, is that if I had tried to make a fade or, or smooth like that deliberately, there's no way it would look that good, right? I, I, I like that. Um, so th this is the same data, but all I've done is just sorted all the items by their probability value. So this is what the SAC should look like. SIP hash is a cryptographic array <coughs> hash function, and as you can see, there's no red whatsoever for the strict avalanche check for SIP hash 2.4. And this is the big test for 2.4. Um, and as you can see, it's basically 50% blue and 50% red. This is all good. That's 128 bits of data? Uh, um, I can't remember if Siphash is a 64-bit seed. Um, so then if we uh, sort it, we get this nice fade. It's all kind of half and half. So basically, that's what a healthy hash function should look like. So now here's some crappy hash functions, DJB2. Um, basically, you can see all the red. You can see that most of the bits of your input byte don't actually affect your, your hash value at all. Um, Here's SDBM, it's also similarly horrible. Um, here's one at a time hard. Now, that's not bad by my book. It's not brilliant, it's not perfect, but it's not bad. Now, you notice something there? One at a time hard is basically that all we do is we randomly choose four extra bytes that we suffix on every key when we hash. So that we always do at least four iterations of the hash fun mixing function, so that we always have the important parts um, properly mixed. So the part that you supply is going to be properly mixed. Um, the last byte might not be quite properly mixed, but again, <coughs> we don't care. You don't care because it's not a byte anybody knows about, right? Um, so an attacker is going to have to now cycle through two to the sixty-four items in order to to undermine the hash function. Um, so, I will now quickly, because I I'm, I'm have like three minutes left or something, right? One minute, 45. Okay, well, um, so um, I have a, a custom built Perl that uses the old hash function. Um, uh, because it's a new Perl, it's randomly <coughs> initializing the seed, but it's using the old hash function, which is attackable. And I've written this script, um, guess, uh, guess seed um, thing, which is basically an extension of Ruslan's um, original attack, just sort of scaled up to be kind of industrial. So this is how long it takes to guess the random seed. Every time it says added, it's made one request to a web server. Oh, wait a minute, am I on the right Perl? Ah. See, that's why we perturb your keys, because even if, right, you're using a crappy hash function, you're still defended. Um, what you can basically see, ah, how do I, Okay, well, you know what? I'm 
This is a, a variant of, of 5.14.2. Um, this is going to be a little less entertaining because it's starting off with a zero seed, but trust me when I say that this program is not relying on the fact that it has a zero seed. Um, so basically, it's now calculating the attack. Um, and it's going to tell us at the end, seed is zero. Um, now, I could uh, rebuild this if you want to come find me later on at lunch or something, I can show you this attack working against a real randomized seed and that it actually does work. But basically, if we count these, um, uh, what did we do? We, um, so, we have one, one, two, three, four, five requests. Gives us enough data to, to crack your hash, your hash seed if it's randomly chosen. Actually, um, wasn't there an environment variable to set the seed, and then you can find it? Um, yeah, there is that as well. Um, the problem is, is that the, because this is 5.14.2, the randomized seed is actually only enabled in this rehash mode. Oh. Um, and for some reason, when I built against the old version, I did it really quickly in the 10 minutes I had coffee at, at the coffee break, and I think I did it wrong, so I apologize. It should have been a little more dramatic. But the point is, is that you don't actually need a lot of data, right? The basic idea is hash a bunch of single letter values, right? Build up a table of the orders that they, that they occur in, right? And then basically run through all the possible hash seeds and see which seeds could produce that order, right? All of the seeds that produce that order are now candidates, <coughs> right? Pick one of those seeds, generate a, a new set of keys, right, using that seed to determine the values, right? And then feed those keys back in, see which ones match. Eventually, you're gonna be left with the seed that produces that order. Now you know the seed, now you can brute force in a set of attack keys, feed it to the attacking side, and now all of a sudden their like, post-parameter parsing or something goes from being 01 to being like ON, you know? So now you have a, um, the ability to attack this, this web server without actually having to send it a lot of requests. So your one request is now like 10,000 times the weight of a normal request or something like that. Um, I'll just end this off by, by saying like, I actually don't think the whole subject of exploiting algorithmic complexity attacks to undermine web servers is that viable. Generally speaking, the amount of data that you would have to hit the web server with or hit the remote server with is itself going to qualify as a data flooding attack, right? So you're just going to take those boxes down by trying to trying to trying to get the data you need, right? Now, obviously, when when it's this easy, no, that's not the case. But so long as we make it a little harder than this easy, right? Then these attacks become basically data flooding attacks, where you can manage that on other levels by just saying, oh, you're not allowed to send me that many keys, you're not allowed to make that many requests in a unit time. You know, your standard, um, you know, management type stuff. Um, and I'll give you guys a chance for questions in the last minus one minute I have. <laughs> very, very briefly, please. If there's any questions? Yes, one question. Uh, the fact that it's your memory on all the pearls, um, this set of values, is this the only thing that has to be submitted or can be interspersed with other stuff in between? Um, if you have the same question. Actually, interspersing it with other stuff could make it worse. Or sorry, could, could actually mitigate the attack. Okay. Could. So, could. So the server has to basically give me a way to give it just a set of stuff without the you know, without the web server adding additional keys well, and things like that. If you knew that it was always going to give you back a constant set of keys, you could construct a set where it wouldn't matter. Right. The place, the the, the place is, is that this is trying to, to create to, to add exactly 
16 keys or 15 keys to every to to a bucket at a time, and then that that then causes Perl to double the size of the hash, and then you give it another set of keys that put 15 keys in a bucket, which causes it to double, okay. right? So so long as you can make sure that the other stuff doesn't land in one of the keys, because if it goes over 16, then Perl goes, ooh, panic, right? And I'll convert this into a different type of hash that isn't vulnerable. So this is not the only example, this is just an example. Yeah, and I need to wrap this up. Yeah. Thank you for your tolerance. Thank you. Thank you.